move on to the chapter 11, chapter 10, brand transport, iron ore and small molecules. Okay. So, as I mentioned before, the plasma membrane plays a cell to exchange molecules and they need to transport a lot of different things across the membrane. We, in the previous two classes, we just showed you how protein kind of um, locate on the membrane or invading the membrane, okay, or move in the, in the membrane. Now, we would like to introduce how molecules uh, transport across the membrane. So if you only talk about uh, uh, the property or permeability of the pure phospholipids, there's no membrane, you will only consider pure phospholipids. What kind of molecule can uh, are permeable to the pure phospholipid? Okay. So this uh, uh, biomembrane, they are have a hydrophobic core and of course there are some space between uh, those are the fit. So the small molecule actually still can really small molecules still can penetrate um, those are the fit. And uh, of course hydrophobic molecule will be easier to trans penetrate the, those membrane. They don't like hydrophilic molecule, they don't like the big big molecule. The big one and the hydrophilic molecule cannot penetrate the fit. So usually the pure phospholipid by there without any membrane protein, they are impermeable to large charge, the one with the different charge, and the hydrophilic molecules, okay? So if you want to design certain drug that can be easily uh, absorbed by the cell, you need to design the small and hydrophobic chemicals, which can be easily absorbed by cells into the cell, and can easily go into the cells, okay? So for example, the gas, a CO2, N2, and O2, they are small molecules. They can easily go in and go out of the, mem of the membranes, okay? So there's no certain kind of um, um, concentration difference between the cell and the, and the kind of extracellular space, okay? The gas can easily go in and out, okay? They cannot generate such a spatial uh, concentration label of the gas between inside the cell and outside the cells. And the small uncharged polar molecules like ethanol can, they are permeable to the membranes. But the water urea, they are slightly permeable, okay, because the water is hydrophilic, and they are not so permeable to the membrane. For the large uncharged polar amino acids, like the glucose and the fructose, they are impermeable to the membrane, they cannot penetrate the membranes. And the, the ion with the charge, they of course cannot uh, penetrate the member because they, they are hydrophilic and they have charge, they cannot kind of easily across this hydrophobic core. And the charge polar molecule, and even the huge size of, like these guys, amino acid, ATP, uh, glucose 6 phosphate, the protein, nucleic acid, they are not the permeable um, to the membrane. Okay? So, uh, and the several factors will determine the fusion rate of the molecule across the membrane. The first is hydrophobicity, okay? If they are hydrophilic, they can easily across. And then the size of the molecule, if they are smaller, it will be easier for them to penetrate the membranes. And also the concentration gradient across the bilayer. If the one molecule have a really high concentration here and a really low concentration here, there is a huge uh, concentration gradient across the membrane, the diffusion rate will be faster, okay? And then also, for in the case of the charge molecule, if there are a lot of uh, certain part, for example, positive charge molecule here and negative charge molecule here, they will kind of generate certain electro potential gradients, and uh, a lot of uh, positive molecule will kind of will move here, and or negative charge molecule will move toward the other side. Okay, so in in reality, uh, the the charge in the the concentration should be considered together. So usually we will say that electrochemical gradient, okay, because these two factors need to be considered together. We will call this electrochemical gradients. Um, okay, then we need to kind of really quickly um, talk about the passive diffusion. So the passive diffusion is kind of um, tendency of, for molecules to spread out uh, evenly into the, um, into the available space. In this part, there is a membrane, okay, uh, to separate the two pools in this environment. 
And in this pool, the left side has a higher concentration of the molecules. Uh, without any energy basement, they still kind of would kind of rate the movement and they would try to spread out to the low concentration part until the both sides concentration reach the same. We call this uh, reach a certain dynamic equilibrium. Okay? Then passive diffusion, the negative uh, moving direction will start and they reach such a dynamic equilibrium. Okay. So, um, as you can see, if the pure phospholipids will allow certain molecules to uh, keep moving across the membrane and uh, kind of prevent other molecules uh, across the membrane, after a while, they cannot generate specific cell environment compared to the extracellular space, right? If there's only pure phospholipid. Cell need to generate specific cell environment to, to establish certain metabolism that is quite different compared to the extracellular space. And that is why we call this guys has is a living star. Okay? It's not a different, it's not the same with the their extracellular space. Okay. So of course they cannot treat establish such a cell specific environment by pure phospholipids. Okay? They need uh, need some help of the member protein. Member protein are the one to generate such a cell specific environment. Okay? So there are several um, member protein on the membrane will kind of to transport specific molecules, specific protein to help cells to generate a specific environment inside of uh, these cell regions. We will talk about the ATP power pump and the arm channels and the different transporters. Okay? Uh, those cartoons, I will teach you how to, how to read those cartoons. This is the membrane, the gray color is the membrane. And it's triangle, the pink triangle, it means the uh, electrochemical gradient of the pink molecules. Okay? And they have a higher electrochemical potential in this size and have lower electrochemical gradient in this size. Okay? So just remember if those, this membrane protein or anything, transport molecule down follow its electrochemical gradient. It doesn't need energy. Okay? If they transfer molecule against electrochemical gradient, it always needs energy. For example, this is a pink, uh, it's the pink uh, molecules, the electrochemical gradient of the pink colors. It's, um, but the, this guys transfer molecule against this electrochemical gradient. That is why this system needs energy. If these guys uh, just move the molecule down or follow its electrochemical gradient, it doesn't need energy. Okay? Okay. So the so this guys is the ATP power pump. This means they use ATP as energy. It will hydro hydrolyze the ATP to ADP and then the organic phosphate and use this as energy to transport pink uh, molecule against the, its electrochemical gradients. And for the ion channel, it, uh, it just curves or open. It just kind of doesn't need any energy. It just uh, the molecule move, the direction of the molecule movement is still following its electrochemical gradient. Those ion channels just kind of provide shortcuts for certain specific molecules to penetrate, to go through this part, follow its electrochemical gradient. Okay? The movement itself doesn't need energy. Of course, the open is a chain ion channel. In some cases, need energy, but it's not what we're talking about. Okay, the movement itself doesn't need energy. Okay, and then there are different kind of transporters. For example, uniporters and the two co-transporter. The uniporter is mean unit is mean only mono or one. Okay, it's only transport one kind of molecules. So uniporter is always a transport uh, molecule follow or down its electrochemical gradients. It doesn't need energy. But a co-transporter uh, needs energy. Okay? Like co-transporter means they will transport multiple molecules, at least uh, two, okay? Two different kinds of molecules. For this symposters, they will transport multiple molecules in the same direction. And the antipoter will transport multiple molecules in the opposite direction. Okay? So this symposter will transport the pink one molecules down its electrochemical gradient and use this transportation as energy 
to transfer the black one to, against it, this electrochemical gradient. Okay? It sounds weird, but I will teach you why we will talk about why this transportation can serve as uh, energy to transport the other one. Okay? Later. Okay? And the antimodal will uh, this antimodal will transport the pink one down its electrochemical gradient and use this transportation as energy to transfer the black one against its, its electrochemical gradient. It needs energy. Okay, this this uh, transport is driven driven by um, there's a pink one transportation. Uh, so the the one need energy we call the active transport. Okay, uh, the one which doesn't need energy but can kind of provide a shortcut uh, to facilitate the movement of those molecules we call the facilitated transport. Okay, so these two guys are unipolar and. Uh, uh, on channel, they don't need energy, they just provide shortcut um, to facilitate the transport we call the facilitated transport. And those are two co transporters need energy, so it belongs to the active transport. But uh, uh, to distinguish this ATP power system and those uh, different transporter system, we call it secondary active transport. Okay, just different definition. Okay, so usually the cell usually uh, they would kind of use a multiple um, member protein to generate. Uh, they would function together in the plasma membrane. For example, this is the plasma membrane. Okay, and this is uh, one kind of ATP power pump, uh, sodium and potassium pump. Uh, this name is because it will transport use ATP to transport sodium and potassium. Okay, so it would use uh, ATP hydrolysis to transport sodium toward this uh, direction and transport a lot of potassium into the cytosol. Therefore, it generates a lot of electrochemical gradient of the potassium in this side and the sodium for electrochemical gradient in this side. Okay? So by generations uh, establishing such uh, electrochemical gradient, uh, those uh, potassium ch uh, channel can provide a shortcut for the potassium to travel from this side to the extracellular space down its electrochemical gradient. Okay? Uh, and then those are sodium lysine symposium symposium in the transport two kinds of molecules in the same direction. They will transport um, sodium from this side to this side down its electrochemical gradients and use this as an energy to co-transport lysine okay, from the extracellular space to the cytosol part. Okay. So energy in base all come from this AD hydrolysis and then they, they generate certain electrochemical gradient and other unchanneled or simple or other transporter they will kind of sense uh, such an electrochemical gradient and uh, do their own job. Okay. So cell can kind of use this way to accumulate or exchange molecules. Accumulate certain um, um, molecules inside and also do some molecule exchange. Okay. Okay, so this table just shows you the comparison of, among the different transporters. Simple diffusion, facilitated transport, active transport, or co-transport, or we call the secondary active transport. So, in, do they need a specific protein? No, simple diffusion do, doesn't need any specific protein. Okay, but uh, this uh, facilitated transport, active transport, and co-transport, or secondary active transport need the specific protein. Okay. And uh, this uh, when this uh, solute transport against its gradient, it's only uh, happen. It's only the case when we need energy. Okay, against its gradient, it always need energy. So active transport and the co transport need energy. This uh, simple diffusion and facilitated transport is always transport molecule down its electrochemical gradient. It doesn't need energy. Okay, would that energy come from ATP hydrolysis? Would be the only this active transport. Well, that uh, dr driven by the movement of the co-transport ion down its gradient would be the kind of triggered by the symposium and the antimodal. Okay, so it would be this part. We put super easy, right? So in this part, I will just uh, uh, quickly let you know the large and the hydrophilic molecule. They are typ typical to diffuse across the membrane. In this case, it's a pure phospholipid. Membrane, okay, but uh, to generate certain uh, specific environment inside of cells, uh, cell need to, uh, need help from a lot of membrane protein. For example, ATP power pump on channel in the transporters. They ATP power pump will use ATP hydrolysis to transport molecule against its uh, chemical 
electrochemical gradients. I'll change a little bit in energy, you just provide a shortcut for the molecule to uh, move it down its electrochemical gradients. And the unit quarters uh, will also kind of try to monitor down its electrochemical gradient. It's important, and the, and the important will kind of energy driven by some uh, molecular transportation to transport the other uh, molecule in the same direction or the opposite direction, respectively. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So, next, we just uh, to let you understand more about the unicorn transport, we would like to kind of compare, give you kind of comparison between the simple diffusion. What's the difference between simple diffusion? On at a unicorn transport. First, simple diffusion is slow, okay? And the unicorn transport is kind of provides shortcut, so it's faster, okay? And uh, the molecule, the driving force is all about the electrochemical gradients, but uh, the unicorn just provides a kind of certain tunnel or certain binding side to keep uh, allowing the molecule to move through this side to the other side. And the specificity, simple diffusion has no specificity. Okay, it totally depends on the property of those solute. If that uh, depends on its uh, size and hydrophobicity, uh, uh, which will determine whether it's permeable or impermeable. But the uniport transport is specific. It only designed for the certain molecules. Okay, for example, the uniport is it could be only uh, designed to transport glucose. It will not uh, ready for the other molecules, only transport glucose. Okay? So it's specific. Or certain ion channel, they are only good for a certain ion channel, they are not good for other ion channel. Ion, okay? So it's specific. And the direction can be, uh, I mean, uh, here reversible will be kind of a little bit confusing. I would say this direction, moving direction, it totally depends on the electrochemical gradients. Okay, it can changeable. Okay, it's always uh, down. It's move down its electrochemical gradient. If this uh, electrochemical gradient become higher here, the move movement direction can move from this side to the other side. So it's kind of transport state is reversible. Okay, yeah, it's not the go here and go back. No, no, no. Okay, you need to keep in mind. Okay, so this is an example to show one kind of unit order, uh, the group one. The GRUT1 probably stands for glucose transport protein. Okay, so the glucose, uh, you will see, is a membrane, and uh, there's a higher electrochemical gradient of the glucose from this side, uh, and less uh, potential heat here. And the, the GRUT1 has a glucose binding site here, and actually this protein they just keep uh, changing their conformation. They will open toward this side and open to the other side and just keep changing between these two combinations. Okay? And the core region of the glucose binding site specific for the glucose binding. Okay? So this guy only can transport glucose. Okay? So there are more glucose right in this side, that is why it has higher electrochemical gradient here. And they will bind to the binding site because this uh, group one can change their combination. They will open to the other end, then they will release the couch of uh, glucose. By uh, keep doing this, they can transport a lot of glucose from this side to the other side. Okay? If the glucose have higher concentration here, of course they can transport glucose from this side to the other side. Okay? And this uh, transportation is only good for the glucose. Okay, so next we will talk about osmosis. Okay? So osmosis is Kind of only happen uh, to the case with a selectively selectively permeable membrane. Okay, it's only the case happen in this system. In this case, it's a U tube, U shaped tube, U uh, tube, U shaped tube. Okay, and uh, separate by the one selectively permeable membrane. And this selectively permeable membrane is uh, kind of uh, the does not allow uh, glucose, there's a lot of uh, sugars, okay, and water in this uh, U-shaped tube. They're good for, this um, a permeable membrane, good for the water to, to across uh, this membrane, <coughs> but the sugar is too big, sugar are too big to pen penetrate this membrane, okay? But, uh, <coughs> sorry. So there are more sugar in this side, and less sugar in this side. 
So the water actually can go uh, from left from these two pools, but the sugar cannot. Okay, but as I mentioned before, sugar is kind of hydrophilic in molecules. Hydrophilic guys like to interact with hydrophilic guys. Water is hydrophilic. Okay, so water, <coughs> or uh, we can say the glucose or sugar provide a lot of water binding site for for water to bind on that cell. Okay. But the sugar cannot go to the other side because this membrane only good for the water movement. So to solve this uh, um, kind of uh, energetically, uh, uh, energetically comparable manners, the ways they just try to move more water to bind to the sugar here in this side, and left the left uh, and left the less water in this side because they are more water binding side. They have more sugar and more water binding side there. So more water it will go there. And generally such a water label different. Okay? That's the pressure, that's the potential. We call the osmosis. Okay? Yeah. It's only happened to the solute cannot uh, easily go in and out, but the water can. Okay? It's only then we will see such an osmosis. So it's also really matter to our our cell because uh, if our cell put in the isotonic solution, which means uh, the solute in the extracellular space, the concentration is similar to what we have inside the cell. So the, the water going in and go out will be with a similar amount. So cell can keep a really good shape, okay? But if you put our cells, uh, red blood cells to the hypotonic uh, solution, which means uh, the solute in the extracellular space is less than what we have inside the cells. So there are more water going to our red blood cells to bind to lose the solute, okay? Then our red blood cells kind of swell, okay, become bigger. But if you put our red blood cells to kind of hypertonic solution, which means uh, those solutions have a higher concentration of the solute. For example, we just drink the sea waters, which have a lot of salt, Let's uh, salt is hydrophilic, and uh, a lot of water would like to find the salt. Okay, so a lot of water would go out from the cell and go to bind to the solute outside the cells, and make our cells shrink. That is why we cannot drink seawater. It will kind of our cell cannot absorb uh, the water. The cell will kind of take out from our cell, okay, to the extracellular space. So. Uh, those are osmosis, and uh, the ability of the surrounding solution to cause cell to gain or lose water, we call them uh, tonicity. Okay. Yeah, but uh, as I mentioned before, when we show talk about the pure um, phospholipid. Osmosis is only happen to the case that the water can really go in and out, right? As I mentioned, the, the U-shaped uh, um, tube. The osmosis only happen when the soil cannot easily go out and uh, um, go across the membrane, but the water can. Okay, but the water actually is not so good. Uh, mod um, it's not the so good to uh, to penetrate uh, across the membrane. It's hydrophilic. It's not easy to penetrate such a hydrophobic core. So, such a pure phospholipid needs the help. Okay, the helper is aquaporin, as I showed you before. Okay, so the aquaporin can provide certain tunnels uh, to facilitate the water movement across the membranes. Um, uh, so. This is the monomer side view of the aquaporin on the invading on the membranes, and this is the, uh, of course, uh, they have a lot of transmembrane building field uh, composed by alpha helix. Okay, but there's a tunnel. Of co of course, the surface are hydrophobic, but there's a tunnel of which is really hydrophilic. Okay, and uh, usually the aquaporin will form the. This is monomer. Okay, um, of the aquaporin, but usually the aquaporin will kind of. It's a tetramer of the uh, to work together. Okay, this is the top view of the aquaporin. They have a hydrophobic surface, but there is a hydrophilic uh, tunnel in the core regions. 
that is, the, and the size of the pore is about the 0.28 nanometer in diameters, which is only slightly larger than the diameter of the water molecules. So those are hydrophilic um, tunnel is good for the water to penetrate across this region. But you may ask, but uh, does so such a hydrophilic tunnel would that be ready to kind of transport other um, ions like a proton? No, it's not good for a proton because there are several <coughs> charged molecules on uh, the wall of this tunnel, so the proton will kind of easily bind to those tunnels and stuff there. So it's only good for the water. Yeah, that's so beautiful, the, such a uh, protein design. Okay. So <coughs> this is uh, simulation modules to show you how water molecules uh, uh, move across these uh, tunnels of the aquifer, and uh, the movement, moving direction is totally <coughs> depends on osmosis pressure. Okay. Well, that, uh, if you place to the hypotonic or hyper, hypotonic or hypertonic uh, solutions, it will determine the movement of the flows of water direction. Okay. So we in this section we just uh, introduce uh, what is the compared to the simple diffusion, the unipolar uh, is faster and the re is reversible and specific. Okay. And also, Tesco also provided two examples of the unipolars. One is GLUT1, which will change their conformation to transport glucose down its electrochemical gradient. And also provide aquaporin, which will provide a channel allowing water molecule to re, uh, move across the membrane. And the diffusion direction is, depends on osmotic depression. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Okay, so. Next, um, we will talk about the ATP power pump, okay, which uses the ATP hydrolysis as an energy to deliver molecules. So why ATP is a major uh, energy source uh, can be utilized inside of cells. So this is the chemical structure of the ATP. It's an adenine and the ribose and the three phosphate group. So the chemical bond among these three phosphate group have a really high energy. So breaking down those chemical bonds, okay, can release a lot of energy locally. So that is why um, certain protein they can break down those ATP T is being TRI tri three phosphate group, okay, and uh, release those into organic phosphate and uh, also obtain the energy to do their job. Okay. So um, the test board kind of introduced four types of the ATP power, uh, power transport protein, the P-class pump, V-class proton pump, F-class proton pump, and the ABC superfamily. So this three proton, this three pump only can transport iron, okay, or proton, it only can transport small guys iron. But the ABC superfamily, they kind of really versatile. They can transport ion, they can transport amino acid, sugar, peptide, lipid, or even certain different type of chemical or Draw, okay? They are super versatile. These three guys can only transport iron. Okay, and they are the guys who kind of can really generate um, um, and maintain the ionic gradient across the cellular membrane. For example, if you check the invertebrate or vertebrate cells, uh, those are concentration of the different ion inside of cell and outside of cell, which is blood, you will see they're quite different. Okay, they always have. So they always have a, such, such an ion gradient between cell and extracellular space. It's all generated, mainly generated from those ATP power pump. Okay, so in the textbook, next, uh, they just mentioned releasing the calcium from sarcoplasmic reticulum, okay, will induce muscle contraction. I would like you to kind of take a look of this video. You use muscles every day to do activities. This woman is using muscles to breathe, circulate blood, and move her hand to take notes. Your cardiac and smooth muscle tissues are involuntary. You do not consciously control their actions. Skeletal muscle works under voluntary control. Skeletal muscles are composed of bundles of muscle fibers. Muscle fibers are long cylindrical cells 
containing several nuclei. Muscles will contract or relax when they receive signals from the nervous system. A neuromuscular junction is the site of the signal exchange. This is where the synaptic bulb of an axon terminal and muscle fiber connect. Muscle fibers are composed of many myofibrils. A myofibril contains contractile units called sarcomeres. Sarcomeres run adjacent to one another down the length of the myofibril. Each sarcomere consists of alternating thick and thin protein filaments giving skeletal muscle its striated appearance. The muscle contracts when these filaments slide past each other. The thick filaments are myosin, which are anchored at the center of the sarcomere, called the M line. The thin filaments are composed of the protein actin, which are anchored to the Z lines on the outer edges of the sarcomere. Because the actin filaments are anchored to the Z lines, the sarcomere shortens from both sides when actin filaments slide along the myosin filaments. Although the action between the filaments is described as sliding, the myosin filament actually pulls the actin along its length. The cross bridges of the myosin filaments attach to the actin filaments and exert force on them to move. This action is known as the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. In this model, the sarcomeres shorten without the thick or thin filaments changing in length. A contraction begins when a bound ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. This causes the myosin head to extend and can attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. An action called the power stroke is triggered, allowing myosin to pull the actin filament toward the end line, thereby shortening the sarcomere. ADP and inorganic phosphate are released during the power stroke. The myosin remains attached to actin until a new molecule of ATP binds, freeing the myosin to either go through another cycle of binding, add more contraction, or remain unattached to allow the muscle to relax. Muscle contractions are controlled by the actions of calcium. The thin actin filaments are associated with regulatory proteins called troponin and tropomyosin. When the muscle is relaxed, Tropomyosin blocks the cross-bridge binding sites on actin. When calcium ion levels are high enough and ATP is present, calcium ions bind to the troponin, which displaces tropomyosin, exposing the myosin binding sites on actin. This allows myosin to attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross-bridge. Calcium ions are stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and are released in response to signals from the nervous system to contract. Neurotransmitter molecules are released from the neuron and bind to receptors, which depolarizes the membrane of the muscle fiber. The electrical impulse travels down the T tubules and opens calcium stores. Calcium ions flow to the myofibrils where they trigger a muscle contraction. As the actin and myosin slide along each other, the entire sarcomere shortens as the C lines draw closer to the M line. As the sarcomeres in myofibrils contract, the entire muscle fiber will shorten. When muscle fibers contract in unison, a muscle can produce enough force to move the body, allowing you to take notes. Good. So just to remind you of the key point of the video, so the new uh, neuron will release the neurotransmitters, which will kind of change the member potential. Uh, and they will trigger the sarcoplasmic reticulum to on the mus in the muscle cell to release the calcium. Okay, so this uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum in steady state is store a lot of calcium. Okay, but neuron stimulation will trigger the to release the calcium in the cytosol. So those uh, calcium releasing from sarcoplasmic reticulum will bind to the lipid troponin and uh, open the binding site of the myosin on those uh, actin and they can do the muscle contraction, okay? So the point is how to kind of generate such a store, how to for cell to kind of store a lot of calcium in such a sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's also uh, kind of helped by the certain calcium ATP power pump or we call the calcium ATPs, okay? So 
this is the membrane. It has a lot of calcium electrochemical gradient in here. In this part, it's working higher and lower here. And this is uh, cytoplasmic reticulum stand of uh, SR in short lumens. But uh, these guys, is calcium ADS, they kind of keep the use ATP binding sites. Then we use the ATP hydrolysis as an energy to keep a pump pumping the calcium to the lumen. Okay? So uh, this, uh, this is the cartel structure of the calcium AD power pump. They have an AD binding site and they have a phosphorylated uh, amino acid site and uh, two calcium binding sites. The, in the first step, uh, it's AD will bind to this, this part, okay? And these two calcium binding sites will allow the binding of the calcium here. Then the AD hydrolysis happens and then uh, it will convert to the ADP, the two phosphate group, diphosphate group, okay, ADP, and the one the organic phosphate group will conjugate or phosphorylate this as parent, uh, as parent here, okay, and this phosphorylation will change the conformation of this uh, ADP power pump, so this tunnel will face to the other side, and then the binding side, this binding side affinity of the calcium will become lower, then that is why the it kind of will release the calcium to these lumens, okay? And after that, the, uh, the phosphate group kind of conjugate with this aspartate will kind of release from this amino acid, then it go back to the original conformation. Keep doing this, uh, this AB power pump can use AB hydrolysis as energy to transfer a lot of calcium from this side to the other side, okay? Why it's called the P collapse pump is because Phosphorylation of the protein in this family is required for the molecular transport. This phosphorylation is a common mechanism for the whole P class pump members to transport molecule from one side to the other side and generally the electrochemical gradient. Okay? And this is a cartoon of those uh, AP power pump, and this is the real kind of protein structure of those uh, AP power pump. Um, as you can see, this is the AP binding site, and uh, the, the amino acid will be phosphorylated. Okay? And inside of here, there is a two calcium binding sites, uh, and the, it's a one conformation, and the other conformation, once they kind of uh, AP hydrolysis, go through the AP hydrolysis phosphorylation and release the phosphorylation, it will change the conformation and the transport the calcium um, um, to SR cytoplasmic. Uh, lumens, okay, and there are a lot of different such uh, calcium AD pump inside the cells. Uh, one, look, a lot of uh, they locate mainly locate to the ER lumens and the mitochondria and the plasma membrane. Okay, so they keep using ADP as an energy to pump a lot of calcium in the ER and the matrix of the mitochondria and the extracellular space. By doing this, the the, the the concentration of calcium in the cytosol is super, super low, okay? That is why you will see the calcium, this is extracellular space, will be the 1.8 nano more, but it's a cell of less than 0 0.0002, okay, uh, nano more. So in the cytosol, the calcium level is super, super low. So in any case, if they release the calcium from all of this pool, a little bit amount of the calcium cell can sense such a contrast. And then, which can serve as a, a messenger to trigger certain signal, for example, the muscle contraction. Okay, so you can easily tell the difference when they have a certain calcium going to the cytosol. Okay, and uh, the protein structure of those uh, P-class uh, protopump are really similar. So the golden one is um, the 3D structure of the sodium potassium ADS, and the purple is the calcium ADS. AP power pump, as you can see, they look really similar. Al almost all of them with each other. Okay, they share a really similar structure. So that is why when we show the sodium potassium AP pump, the cartoon looks really similar. Okay, they also have a AP binding site, a phosphorylating site, and several uh, binding site for they to transport certain molecules. So this is the sodium potassium ADS. It means they transport sodium and potassium. Okay, so in the tunnel, there's uh, three sodium binding sites and uh, two potassium binding sites. 
and they have a two different conformation. One, to, the tunnel was toward this uh, cytosol part, and the, the other conformation, those uh, uh, tunnel were faced to the other side, okay? So the NP will bind to this part and uh, do the hydrolysis and uh, do the phosphorylation, and in this conformation, they will have a stronger uh, affinity uh, for those binding sites to bind the sodiums, okay? But have a weak affinity for this uh, potassium binding sites with to the potassium, okay? That is why there's no pot a potassium can bind here, okay? But once they um, for, um, release those uh, phosphate phosphorylations, they will change the conformation to the other uh, E2 conformation. In this E2 conformation, they have a stronger conformation of the affinity with the potassium and the lower affinity with the calcium. So that is why E2 conformation, it will release calcium but it will bind the potassium, okay? By keep doing this, it will pump a lot of uh, calcium to this side and generate, the, uh, sodium, sorry, sodium to generate such a natural chemical gradient. They pump a lot of calcium, uh, potassium, sorry, potassium in this side and generate such a potassium natural chemical gradient, okay? Okay, so next we talk about the V-class proton pump. Okay, so this V stands for the vacuum or the vascular, okay? So because this uh, V-class protopon always found, uh, can be found in the uh, uh, vacuum or can be found in a certain vascular like the organelle or vesicle, okay? And they only um, pump proton, okay? So that is why they call the proton pump. So in this case, uh, they will use in this vesicle, they will kind of of use ADP hydrolysis of energy to pump a lot of proton in the lumens, okay? Um, and but in this case, but in this case, uh, it pump a lot of proton in this part, but it cannot. Uh, uh, what's the do you know what's the definition of the pH? Do you know what's the definition of the pH? It depends on. The concentration of the proton, right, in certain environment. And if the higher concentration of the proton is in lower pH level, okay, it's more acidic, okay. So, but why in these two systems, this guy pump a lot of proton here, it can cannot lower the pH, but in this case, it need to uh, pump the proton, but it need to co-transport chloride to lower the pH. What's the difference? Because the pH is level is depends on the concentration of the proton. It's not depends on chloride. It totally depends on the P, uh, proton concentration. What's the reason? It's making me really confusing in the beginning. But actually, uh, the key clue is here. If you just pump a lot of proton here, uh, it's a positive charge and it will generate such an electrochemical gradient of, of potential here. And uh, such an electro a chemical gradient were easy to uh, make as those uh, proton leak out, or there are a lot of other proton on channel or proton transporter will use this electro uh, chemical gradient to transport out of those uh, proton outside of this uh, lumen. So that is why actually uh, this ADP power pump cannot accumulate enough proton molecule in this vesicle lumen. Okay, and those are uh, ADP pumping uh, in rate is really slow. The one way is to accumulate enough uh, proton to lower the uh, pH, you need to kind of reduce such electrochemical gradients. The way they do achieve this is they use uh, chloride ion channels to, re, uh, to transfer a lot of chloride, and the proton will bind with the chloride to become an HCl, and the kind of, uh, then they will remove such a no electrochemical gradients. So, that is why they can keep enough amount of the proton inside of such a lumen and make a pH lower. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, let me see. So, we now talk about the PVF class ADP power pump. Uh, now, it's talk about the F class uh, proton pump. But, uh, Let's take a while to finish this part. Probably uh, we can finish today here.
and then we will start from the F class protocol next week. Okay, are there any questions so far? No? Okay, see you next week. <laughs>